Blood in the Mist by Hope Merleys, adapted by Joy Wilkinson. The free state of Dorimer was a very small country, bound on the south by the sea, on the north and east by mountains, and on the west by the debatable hills beyond which lay fairyland. Lud in the Mist was the capital of Dorimer, situated at the confluence of two rivers, the Dapple and the Dool. The Dool flowed from the sea and helped Lud become a hub of middle-class merchants. The Dapple flowed from fairyland and played no part in the commercial life of Lud. But an old maxim of Dorimer bade one never forget that the Dapple flows into the Dool. The merchant burghers had forgotten that, but it hadn't always been that way. In the old days, when Dorimer had been a duchy, fairy things were revered. The most solemn event of the year was the arrival from fairyland of hooded strangers with milk-white mares, laden with fairy fruit for the duke. But the dukes grew capricious and selfish until those failings culminated in Duke Aubrey, a hunchback with a face of angelic beauty who seemed possessed by a laughing demon of destruction. He rejoiced with the living, turned priest for the dying, and was the most exquisite poet. But his pranks had a sinister humour. He once bet that he could make his jester commit suicide, and when the poor man was found hanging, the Duke laughed so much it said his laughter still echoes to this day. The people rose up against him, and after a bloody battle, the nobility fell, and Duke Aubrey vanished, some said to Fairyland. The new merchant powers outlawed all things fairy. Under the new regime, the fruit was so taboo it could not even be mentioned by name. It was called silk and decried as delusion. What was truly lost was the tragic sense of life. Without fairy fruit, a sense of mortality vanished from their poetry and art, and so as the years went by, the ruling class of Lud became a set of indolent, self-indulgent, humorous gentlemen. The mayor of Lud in the Mist was... Master Nathaniel Chanticleer. A typical Dormerite, rotund, red-haired, his eyes twinkling with jokes like trout in a burn. All who knew Nat would have been surprised to discover that he was not a happy man. His life was poisoned at its springs by a small, nameless fear. As a boy, he had found a strange old instrument in the attic, a lute with a carving of a cockerel's head. Let's see if you have a crick left in you, old fellow. Nat was never again the same. The cock's crow that he always loved so grew sinister. A cheese became the moon. A baked apple became a skull. But it wasn't really an apple. It was the note. Before the note, young Nat had vowed... I'd rather be the captain of one of my father's ships than be the owner of the whole fleet. Stuck at home. After the note, he wanted to stay at home. It generated in him a wistful yearning after prosaic things he already possessed, as if he thought he'd already lost what he was holding in his hands. And with the yearning came the fear, lurking within these homely objects, that at any moment the hidden menace would spring out and they would change. <laughs> as time passed, and he hated any mention of time passing, Nat yearned most for things that didn't change. His favourite place was his silent pleached alley, the tunnel of trees in which he found the peace of still life, unsullied by the note. He also loved the old graveyard known as the Fields of Grammary. It might seem odd that one fearful of change and death liked to loiter among gravestones, but Nat found comfort in their frozen beauty and simplified passion. Here lies Ebenezer Spike, baker, who, having provided the citizens of Lud in the Mist for 60 years with fresh sweet loaves, died at the age of 88, surrounded by his sons and grandsons. How willingly he would have changed places with that old baker. Then the thought would come. Perhaps epitaphs are not always to be trusted. Most of all, he was comforted by the view of Lud from the fields of Grammary in the late afternoon, when human beings themselves seemed to have found the secret of still life. <laughs> 
If life in Lod could always be like that, there would be no need to die. No one would have guessed that Nat troubled himself with epitaphs or was anything other than a happy mare, husband to Dame Marigold, father to young Ranoff, and about to celebrate his 50th birthday. No one loved parties more than Nat, so it was gleefully that he invited all his cronies to... Come and meet a moongrass cheese. By seven o'clock, the Chanticleer's parlour was filled with a cream of Lud society, laughing and chattering about the usual nonsense. Only young Ranulph was silent and still, until... Fill your glasses and drink to the king of moongrass cheeses. To the king of the moongrass cheeses. No, I won't let you. By the Milky Way, Marigold, what's taken the boy? Ranulf, go to your room. But if he kills the moon, all the flowers will wither in fairyland. Oh. Bed, this instant, I'll deal with you later. Uh, I'm so sorry, I don't know what's got into him. <laughs> the, the boy is clearly unwell. Um, um, now, um, who would like to taste the moongrass cheese? Ambrose? Of course. Thank you, Nathaniel. Until now, Nat had viewed Ranoff more as an heirloom than a son, like the crystal goblet with which Duke Aubrey had baptised the first ship owned by the Chanticleer. An object Nat rarely thought about, though the loss of it would drive him half mad. Now it was as if Nat had found a crack in that goblet, a hideous flaw in this precious thing. <sighs> Come, my son, stop crying. We're not responsible for what we say when we're out of sorts. It was something made me say it. Now, I never want to hear such language again, understood? I want to get away from things happening. <laughs> Nothing happens in love. Summer and winter and days and nights. All the things. The whole of me seems to have got inside my head and to hurt. Like it all gets inside a tooth when one has toothache. Now, this won't do. Chivy the black rooks away from the corn. There are no black rooks. All the birds are golden and the cockerel speaks to me. We all have our moments, but we well, we stick a smile on our faces and, and, and go about our business. I am not like you, father. I have eaten fairy fruit. What? One of the grooms. Willie Wisp, he gave it me and told me after what it was. Now you'll never be the same again. Willie Wisp, that son of a fairy. All that seems to matter is to get away where there are shadows and quiet, where I can get more fruit. Don't say that, Ranulph. Ever since I ate it, everything has frightened me. Have you ever felt frightened of homely things, Father? What does the cockerel say to you? Uh, well, he, he, he says to me, he, he says that the past will never come again, but we must remember that the past is made of the present and that the present is always here. He, he says that the, the dead long to be back on the earth. He tells me to come away from real things, things that bite me. Hold me, father! Hold me! Oh, it's, it's all right, my boy. We'll all be all right, sir. Marigold, send for Endymion Lear. Why not our usual doctor? These are not usual circumstances, so unfortunately, Dr. Lear is our only hope. And the boy says he's been eating the, the stuff we don't mention. Why the Harvest of souls, these chanty clears. Suffering cats, woman! I will fetch Lear myself. And Dimian Lear arrived in Lud 30 years ago, from no one knows where. He became the most popular physician in town by tending to the poor folk, often for free, and took a genuine pleasure in his craft. Life and death. <laughs> they are the dyes in which I work. Are my hands stained? <laughs> Leah was a harsh critic of the senators and the chief source of jokes about the mayor. Nat considered him impudent, but an expert in matters of silk. You'd better take me to see your son and heir. Do, do you think you'll be able to cure him? Yeah, I never answer that kind of question before I've seen the patient. And uh, not always then. 
Say good day to the doctor, Ranulf. Uh, leave me alone with him. He'll talk more easily without you two here. Well, if you think so. Oh. Go and have a pipe, Nat. We must be calm. I don't trust that fellow. One really must allow a doctor to have his way. I, I'm going back to check. Marigold. Do you hear? What's the matter now? Marigold. Don't you hear? Oh, I, I hear a vulgar song my nanny sang. Right. What are you doing? Nat, come back! Oh! <laughs> And Son of the fairy! Uh, oh. Spoiling it, Father! He was making me well! Oh, let him go, Nat! Oh, have you lost your senses? <laughs> A good shaking helps to settle the humours. What were you doing to my son? Songs were cures long before herbs, and that's a very old song. You must have known it all your life. Oh. Uh. <laughs> I, I, I don't quite know what took me. I, I, I've been anxious. No doctor worth his salt takes offence with sick men. Hmm. Now, I should like to have a private talk with you, sir. Good news, Your Worship. I don't believe your boy has eaten what one mustn't mention. I knew it! Oh... Oh, but why in the name of the Milky Way would he invent such a story? We only have Willy Wisp's word that it was silk, and... No, I can confidently say that your son is no more likely to have eaten fairy fruit than you are. Oh. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lear. Well, now, now, to, um, to apologize for my behavior, we must pledge each other in wild time gin. Huh? Why look for any other cure when we have the wild time? Hmm? Time gin, slow gin, so soothing. Ah, ah yes. Ah, still, the boy's not himself. So, uh, what is the matter with him? What is the matter with you? What? I once had the honor of having your worship as my partner at a game of cards. We lost. Because each time you held the most valuable card in the pack, the Lyre of Bones, you discarded it as if it had burnt your fingers. Uh, things like that set a doctor wondering. You are a man who is frightened about something. Oh, damn your impudence. Can you help my boy or not? Uh, this is a necessary preface to what I want to say about your son. To show that even though one has never come within a mile of fairy fruit, one can have all the symptoms of having tasted it. What? The effects of fairy fruit that we regard as a malady are in reality more like a melody. A tune that one can't get out of one's head, if you can imagine that. Anyone who has tasted fairy fruit walks through life to a different tune. But one can be born to a different tune. Which is the case with your son. Because of me? This is my fault. You are not good for your son. He must be taught another tune, different from any he has heard before. He must go and lodge on a farm. Spend time around the sowing and reaping. Quiet days, healing nights. Eh? I know just the place. <laughs> Belongs to an old friend of mine, Widow Gibberty. I know that name. Uh, she had a case in the courts long ago. A thieving laborer, something and nothing. But happily, she's still at the farm near Swan on the Dapple. But that's in the west, close to the Elfin Marshes. He would be much further from temptation than here. I don't want him going so damnably near that place. That place which does not exist in the eye of the law? Where the dead tend blue cattle and reap the fields of jelly flowers? Huh? For once, let us look things in the face, Your Worship. No one has been to Fairyland within the memory of man. But there is not a single homely thing that does not become fairy when looked at from a certain angle. Think of the dapple at sunset, or an autumn wood. What if we saw them for the first time? A golden river, flaming trees. 
For all we know, it may be Doromir that is Fairyland to the people across the debatable hills. You can't say that. What a thing to say. The malady you suffer from should be called life sickness. Get your sea legs, Master Nathaniel. Oh. And do not let it infect your son and Chanticleers to come. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're right. Uh, of course. And let me arrange this trip for your son. <laughs> I will escort him there myself, if it would ease your fears. Um, uh, very well. You, you may take him tomorrow. Thank you, sir. You will not live to regret this. <laughs> the next morning, Ranulph was booted and spurred and ready to leave with Lear, as Nat made his excuses. I'd have taken you there myself, but it's against the law for the mayor to leave blood. Except on circuits. I know, Father. And... Oh! Now the Black Rooks will fly away, and you'll come back merry as a grig. Say goodbye now, Master Ronald. It's time to go. Goodbye, Father. If you need me, just send word. As they rode out of blood, Nat felt relief that his problem was gone. He didn't hear the women calling down blessings on the head of Endymion Lear, adding that it was a pity he was not mayor. Mad old Mother Tibbs tossed the doctor a nosegay. Oh, how doodle do! <laughs> the little master's bound for the land where the eggs are all gold. Ranulph did write to his father. Something's not right here. There's an old weaver called Petunus. He plays strange reels on his fiddle and sits by a stone herm in the orchard, like the statues in the fields of Granary, as if he hopes it will come to life. He can hardly speak except to say, Dick, Dick, Dick. And riddles. I milk blue ewes, I reap red flowers, I weave the story of dead hours. I think Petunus may be a dead man. Ranulph sealed the letter and gave it to Dr. Lear, but Lear didn't pass it on to Nat on his return. Instead, he reported, The boy is thriving, learning to live to a different tune. So he'll be back soon. The change must be sustained. It would be selfish not to let him stay on until his recovery is complete. Well, that makes sense. And I do have a lot of work to do. Nat went to see Mumchance, the captain of the yeomanry who had been tasked to find Willy Wisp. No trace of him, Your Worship, but I have noted an increase in the consumption of silk in the low quarters of the town, of course. It must be stopped, Mumchance. If you ask me, Your Worship, something's brewing. What do you mean? Folks are starting to take an interest in Duke Aubrey again, saying he's coming back. Duke Aubrey is long dead. And all I know is when Ludd talks of Duke Aubrey, it always bodes trouble. Oh, fiddlesticks. It was soon after that that trouble began to happen in the least likely place. Miss Primrose Crabapple's Academy for Young Ladies. Miss Primrose was a moon-faced schoolmarm with a romantic passion for Duke Aubrey. Over her bed hung his portrait and there was ivy embroidered all over the academy. Miss Primrose also had a romantic passion for Dr Lear, which her pupils, known as the Crabapple Blossoms, found hilarious. On the day in question, Moonlove Honeysuckle and Prunella Pie Powders were whispering in sewing class. I heard Dr. Leah came over last night for cribbage and cowslip wine with Miss Primrose. Thrown over for a stuffy old doctor? It's so hard on Duke Aubrey. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough, Blossoms. Finish your seams and come for your dancing lesson. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she dismissed the dance teacher. She's got a new one. I spied him. Oh, what's he like? Bright red hair and the pointiest face. I don't like him. This is our new dance instructor, Professor Wisp, and his accompanist, Master Portunus. Fiddler to his majesty, Emperor of the Moon. He's come a long way, young ladies, to set your feet to dancing. 
<laughs> dig, dig, dig! I'm sure Professor Wisp was one of the grooms at my Uncle Nathaniel's house. What can Miss Primrose be thinking of to engage such low people? Fortunus is a gifted musician and weaver. We are lucky to have him, thanks to Dr. Lear. Fortunus is your man if you want silk. Oh, oh, oh. What's in these sacks? It feels too soft for apples. <laughs> Ugh, it smells horrible. Don't touch those, my dears. <laughs> Take your places. We shall begin with Columbine. But that's a country dance for farm servants. My mother wouldn't like me learning new things, and Columbine's so vulgar. Why, my pretty miss, Columbine was danced in the moonlight when Lud was a beechwood between two rivers. Oh, <laughs> Professor Wisp is going to teach you very old and aristocratic dances, my dears. Dances such as were danced at the court of Duke Aubrey. Now, dance! Within and without, in and out, round as a ball, with hither and thither, as straight as a line, with lily jam under and soaps in wine, with sweet briar and bonfire and strawberry wire and columbine. And last for a duke, a duke who wears green in lands where the sun and the moon do not shine, with lily jamanda and soaps in wine, with sweet briar and bonfire and strawberry wire and columbine. As they whirled and twirled, unable to stop, someone new joined the dance, wearing a black mask. And in spite of all the crossings and recrossings, he was never beside them. They never felt the touch of his hand. But Moonlove Honeysuckle caught a glimpse of his back, and on it there was a hump. Damn Duke Aubrey. While his daughter danced, Ambrose Honeysuckle was in his garden, listening to Nat rant. Lot must be made safe. We will stop the silk trade and catch the smugglers who plot against our town. I'll drink to that, Nat. A pledge in wild time. Oh, we'll break the spell by the golden apples of the West. We'll break it. An excellent pledge. I know an even better one. An oath my father taught me from the days when the Chanticleers brought down the Duke. We... Nathaniel Chanticleer and Ambrose Honeysuckle do swear by the living and the dead, by the past and the future, by memories and hopes, that if a vision comes begging at our door, we will take it in and warm it at our hearth, and that we will not be wiser than the foolish, nor more cunning than the simple, and that we will remember he who rides the wind needs must go where his steed carries him. Sounds good to me. Here's to it, my old friend. Ah! Uh, uh, moon love? My dear child, what's this? The horror of midday. The tune that never stops. Break the fiddle. What's wrong with her, Nat? Is it something? I, I have no idea. Father, cut the strings. I want the dark. <laughs> Call Dr. Lear. The horror. The horror. Let me go. Moon love, wait. Swift as a hare, she ran. The two men stood, bewildered for a second. Then they pounded after her into the high street. It's Miss Honeysuckle <laughs> running away from her papa. <laughs> you should have had these cobbles with you. That damnably slippery. Down the high street, across the old bridge over the Dapple, towards the town walls and the west gate. If all these back pigs of senators were set running more often, uh, they'd make much better bacon. <laughs> Stop! What? Why? It's a funeral procession. We have to let them pass. Who loves getting away? Do the dead bleed, Ambrose? What? That coffin was bleeding. But, Toast, you must have sunstroke too. The funeral passed on, winding its way to the fields of Grammary. I'll never catch her now. I'm going to the Academy. I want an explanation. So do I. Miss Primrose, get down here in the name of... Be quiet, Ambrose. Listen, they're not here. It's empty. What are those sacks? 
Empty too. Uh, no, there's stains. Juice? Uh, who is that? Um, show yourself. It's Pie Powder's last Prunella. Come out from the shadows, girl. Where is Miss Primrose and the other blossoms? Dancing. Dancing day and night. Tell the truth, Prunella. We're worried about Moon Love. She was scared out of her wits something about cutting fiddle strings. <laughs> she can't do that. What has taken Moon Love? Supposing. Supposing she has eaten fairy fruit. Do you dare to insinuate? My daughter? <laughs> there he is! It's just a portrait of Duke Aubrey. Uh, no, Nat. Look. It's a window. Did you see that? Did you see him? It wasn't him. It's it's this place. We oh, we need to get out. I need to go home. Wait for Moon Love. I'll see Mum Chance. We must make Lud safe. Whatever it takes. The blossoms were last spotted running due west. They must be stopped before they perish in the elfin marshes or vanish forever into fairyland. Dr. Lear found Miss Primrose. Down at the wharf. She's gone quite mad. We've had to lock her up. I want patrols on the West Road, guards at all the gates, a dossier compiled on every inhabitant. Do you hear? No more fairy fruit! While Nat took drastic measures to stop the smuggling, Dr. Lear was in demand. Wherever he went, he managed to leave the impression that Nathaniel Chanticleer was to blame for it all. Soon the doctor called on Ambrose. I'll hang Miss Primrose from her own doorpost, giving my daughter fairy fruit. Are, are you aware that Ranulph Chanticleer has partaken of it too? It's one of the worst cases I've seen. What? Does Nathaniel know? Mum Chance warned him months ago of an alarming increase in the consumption of a certain commodity, yet Nathaniel took no steps. Did it never strike you that he was a haunted man? What are you insinuating? If a man has tasted fairy fruit once, he is never again the same. Ah, Ambrose, um, how are you feeling now? You knew of the spread of this evil, but took no steps to stop it. And now your own son has eaten it. You may have eaten it yourself, for all I know. You foul, gibbering son of a fairy. <laughs> That's enough now. <laughs> Master Honeysuckle must rest. I'll walk out with your worship. What have you been telling him, Leah? He's upset about his child. He's not thinking straight. You must understand that. Uh, of course. But if it weren't for my ministerial obligations, I'd write to the farm right now to see Ranulph. But that would play into the hands of your enemies. Make people think that the rumours were true. What rumours? I heard that Ebenezer Prim, that paragon of dignity, won't come to wind your clogs himself anymore and only sends his new apprentice. Well, that's not true. Well, not as far as I'm aware. Even the senators speak of you, Sarge. Yeah, but that's only to be expected in this silk-stained town. Yes, it would be madness to bring Ranoff back now. I mean, nowhere is more fraught with danger for the boy. Very wise. Your Worship, let the widow take care of Ranulf, and I shall take care of you. Blood <laughs> will be all the better for it. Tell me something, Clear. Do the dead bleed? What do you mean by that? I saw blood oozing from a coffin, but I've seen so many strange things today that I've ceased to trust my own eyes. <laughs> Oh, oh, sorry, Your Worship. I, I have such a grisly question to give me a turn. <laughs> do the dead bleed? Um, do pigs fly? <laughs> it is wonderful what we imagine we see when we're unhinged by strong emotion. <laughs> but I must go back to work now. <laughs> Birth and death wait for no man. Nat wandered in the fields of Grammary, seeking comfort in the tombstones. Hyacinth mourns for Forget-Me-Not, who was alive and now is dead. But even his epitaphs were powerless to help. Then he noticed that the door to his family chapel was ajar. The Chapel of the Chanticleers was one of the loveliest monuments in Ludd. 
an exquisite little pleasure house once owned by the Duke, who liked to enjoy revelries in a graveyard. After the revolution, the Chanticleers made it their place of rest, but there was no rest for Nat. By my great aunt's rump, in the mosaic wall where I've looked a thousand times and never seen a secret door. Leading to a staircase, leading to a tunnel, leading to another door, locked. Password? Oh, by the sun, moon and stars and the golden apples of the west. And see you knowing the password. There were tapestries on the walls, blues, pinks and brilliant greens. And what was this lying on the floor in heaps? Pearls, sapphires and monstrous rubies? Or windfalls from the trees on the tapestries? Fairy fruit? Where does it all come from, Mother Tips? All the pretty gentlemen bring it. When Lud is fast asleep, and then the cock says, cock a doodle doo, and I'll tell you something, Master Nat Cock of the Roost, you'll soon be dead, and I'll be a fine lady dancing under the moon. Now you'll find yourself dancing to another tune unless you tell me who these gentlemen are. Who brings that filthy fruit? Night is falling. Go back through that tunnel and you'll soon find out. <sighs> Nat tiptoed out of his chapel into the moonlit graveyard and hid behind a tree as he watched. Hi. Two men digging up a fresh grave. One, a brawny fellow with sailor's gold rings in his ears. The other, Endymion Lear. We better have a, a peep inside the coffin. Check the goods have been delivered. He opened the lid. Moonlight illuminated. Very fruit. Are you certain, Nat? I'll swear to it, Ambrose. It wasn't blood in that coffin, it was juice. It was Leah all along. The rascal! He'll hang for it! Now, um, Mum Chance, dig out the old case file on Widow Gibberty. I need to know if she's to be trusted or if she's stained by his crimes too. I'll have one of the guards find the file. Let's get back to that room and catch Leah in the act. <laughs> Empty! No fruit! Not even any stains. There's another door. Uh, it was hidden by the tapestries, so that's how they've escaped. But we might still catch them. Come on. <sighs> Rusty Bridget. <gasps> We're in the guild hall. So <laughs> your search has been a fruitless one. Arrest him, Mum Chance. For what, sir? There's no evidence of any crime. If you want evidence, try the mayor's house. Did you hide silk in our grandfather clock? Le Leah must have done it somehow. I haven't been here since I saw Ranulph. And this fruit is fresh. No, no, no I'm a... it, It's the new apprentice who winds the clocks with, with the sharp chin and nimble fingers. No more lies, Nat. Leah was right. You've tasted the fruit and fed it to your son. And my daughter. Oh, you Chanticleers. Nathaniel Chanticleer can no longer be mayor. Ambrose, you must remove him from office. This was your plan all along, to get rid of me. But you've forgotten one thing, Lear. Nothing but death has the power to dismiss the mayor of Lud in the mist. I know you like to hide behind official obligations and the delusion of law, but a senator can declare the death of any mayor held to be a menace. No. Ambrose, you wouldn't... Silence. I hereby declare Master Nathaniel Chanticleer dead in the eye of the law. <laughs> Nat's robes of office were given to the new mayor, Ambrose Honeysuckle. Nat was wrapped in a shroud, carried through the streets and out of the west gate as the crowd burned his effigy. Nat was left outside the Walls of Lud, alone, except for the yeoman guarding the gate. Is that the late Master Nathaniel Chanticleer? Uh, I'm afraid so. I don't know if you still want this, what with you being dead and all, but I was told to get you this case file. Carp versus Gibberty. 
Lovely. Indeed, I still want this. Um, uh, thank you. No longer able to hide among his graves or behind the official obligations of being alive, Nat started to feel something new. Not the fear that had governed most of his first 50 years, but something more like the freedom and passion he had felt as a boy. I'd rather be the captain of one of my father's ships than be the owner of the whole fleet. Stuck at home. With it came a longing for the boy he'd sent away. Where are you going, sir? I'm going west. Nat set off, reading the file, speeding up as he realised what he had, and what he now had to do. Leah lied about the widow Gibberty. The case was actually brought against her by the farmhand, Diggory Clark, who swore that she murdered her husband, that she conspired with her lover, a herbalist called Christopher Pugwalker, to smuggle fairy fruit through the farm and poisoned the farmer when he found out about it. But the only proof was that when they paid their respects to the farmer's dead body, the body bled. In old country law, this revealed the killers, but that didn't pass as evidence in a Ludd court. So Widow Gibberty was acquitted, Pugwalker vanished, and Diggory Carp was thrown in prison on the widow's counterclaim of theft. His family died of starvation, and when he got out, he hanged himself. Oh, poor fellow. Was he telling the truth? Do the dead bleed? What do you mean by that? Clear was Christopher Pugwalker before he turned up in Ludd. Now that's why he lied about the case, so I wouldn't stop him sending Ranulph to the farm. Oh, this was all part of his plan. To corrupt my boy, to, to bring me down and fill Ludd with silk and ruin the great family that saved Dorimer from the Duke. Oh, oh, Ranulph. Oh, in trying to save you, I trusted you to two murderers and silk smugglers. How far away is Swan on the Dapple? I must run faster. Oh. Swan was too far for a 50-year-old dead man to run in the midday sun. Nat collapsed by the roadside. He dreamt of his own father, who said that fairy things are delusion, but that man can't live without delusion. So he creates the law, a delusion he can master. I must find Leah guilty of something in the eye of the law, so I can save Lud and live again. In the dream, his father smiled, and Nat suddenly noticed his father's bright eyes and pointed chin, not altogether human, but not altogether fairy. Was he a real person too? Had his father and all the Chanticleers heard the note? Jig, jig, jig! Jig, jig, jig! Nat woke to find an old man crouching over him with a fiddle. The man whom Ranulph knew as Portunus, but Nat didn't know at all. Or so he thought. Oh, suffering cats! Well, well <laughs> who might you be? Who are you? Who is me? Answer my riddle and come and see! I've no time for riddles. Is that your horse by the tree? What is it that's a tree, and yet not a tree? A man, and yet not a man? Who is dumb, and yet can tell secrets? I need to get to the Widow Gibberty's farm. Do you know it? Dig, dig, dig! Dig and delve! Delve and dig! Oh, very well. You, you can come with me if your mare will still ride fast with two. She rode fast with them on her back. As they went, that longing grew in Nat to hold Ranulph in his arms. A rush of feeling he couldn't name, but it swelled in his chest as they reached the farm. Before he could rush in, Portunus pulled him into the orchard, where the old stone herm stood amidst the trees. A tree, yet not a tree. A man, yet not... What secrets can it tell? Dig! 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 Nat dug deep below the herm and found... A small iron box containing a parchment, a, a letter from Jeremiah Gibberty. A full account of how the widow and Pugwalker killed him. Dig! 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 Wait, is that your name? Dig! Dig! Diggory! Diggory Carp! 
back from the dead, unable to rest until justice is served. Well, I am a dead man too, Diggory. We'll get the guard from the West Road and get justice for us both! Clementina Gibbety, I arrest you for the murder of your late husband. Tonight, the dead have found their tongues. What's going on? Who are these people, Portunus? Tick, tick, tick. This is Yeoman Pease. I'm Nathaniel Chanticleer, and his name isn't Portunus, it's Diggory Carr. Diggory. He's one of the silent people. I took care of him like a tame bird, but what? Dad know of kindness. He has no cause for gratitude, only for revenge on you and your accomplice, Dr. Endymion Lear, or Christopher Pugwalker. Is that not his true name? <sighs> what does your law care about the truth? It was someone far greater than Pugwalker and me who ordered the death of Farmer Gibberty. Who do you mean? Who, who is behind all of this? <sighs> One who cares not for good and evil and sows his commands like grain. But set your mind at rest, Chanty Clear. You can't be summoned to a court of law. Unlike you and Lear. Let's get you to lad. Oh. I'm staying oh. to get my son. Where is he? He heard you could be summons and he followed it across the hills. <laughs> Before Nat's inward eye flashed a picture of Ranulph weeping among the jilly flowers. A horror of impotent tenderness swept over him and a sense of relief, in no way mitigating the agony, but as if to say... Well, it has come at last. He has gone to the land whence no one returns. No one returns, but I can go there. You don't really mean you're going yonder. Aye, and beyond yonder, if need be, to find my son. As Nat rode west, the widow was taken east for the Senate trial. She went quietly, but the same could not be said of Dr. Lear, who held court. My friends, you have forfeited your place on earth. For there are two races, trees and men. Trees live and die, but do not know the taste of life or death while in man's mouth is ever that bittersweet taste. He is tormented by memory, hope, and a secret he can only tell in whispers of music and poetry. And what they say is never the same as what they know. Citizens of Lud, to which tribe do you belong? To neither! For you are not serene, majestic, and silent. Nor are you restless, passionate, and tragic. I could not turn you into trees, but I had hoped to turn you into men. Nat rode higher into the hills, feeling ever more drowsy, as if he were riding in a dream. He found himself in a crowd of peasants making merry. These... Are they whom men call dead? And this is the market of souls. Fairy fruit, three for a penny, sir. Mm, no, no, thank you. Uncle Nathaniel! Crab apple blossoms, come and pick your what? blossoms what? and put them to work in the jilly flower fields. Master Chanticleer, help! Meet me in office, sir. You have no right to do this, no right whatsoever. Chanticleer the dreamer, who has never tasted fruit. You have no power over me, Wisp, nor over these girls. This is not fairyland. It's only the elfin marshes. They cannot be sold. Let them go back home. As you wish, sir. Good to see you here at last. Uncle Nathaniel, you saved us. You and the law. Chanticleer and the law. Chanticleer and the law. The blossoms ran back to Lud, where Lear went on in court, as Nat went on his journey. There is a land where the sun and moon do not shine, where the birds are dreams, the stars are visions, 
and the immortal flowers spring from the thoughts of death. In that land grow fruit, flavoured with life and death, and it is the proper nourishment for the souls of man. That is why I smuggled it into Dorimer, and why I had to kill the farmer Gibberty, who would have put a stop to it. I will die for it, but I have not lived in vain. Someday, my master, the lord of life and death, will come dancing at the head of his silent battalions to make wild music once more in Dorimer. This then, is my defense. Endymion Lear and Clementina Gibberty, I find you guilty of murder and consign your bodies to the birds and your souls to whence they came. May all here present take example from your fate, for every tree can be a gallows and every man has a neck to hang. They were hanged from the gibbet in the great court and Miss Primrose hanged herself from an apple tree in her orchard. I glory in being made a humble instrument of the fickle master, whom my sweet doctor served so well. As Nat rode on, he saw them, Miss Primrose, Widow Gibberty, and Endymion Lear amongst the silent people heading west, and Diggory Carp at last, accompanying them on his fiddle. What if I'm too late? If Ranulf is with the dead already, and there are corpses all around. This was not the frozen beauty of the fields of Grammary. Nat touched one of the corpses. Warm and fresh. Can't be real. Whoa! They're warm! Oh, oh, oh my poor mare. Slain by the winds of Fairyland. Oh, will they kill me too? There are windfalls of dreams, there's a wolf in the stars. Run off. And life is a nymph who will never be fine. Is that you? Or me? When I was a boy. When I first heard the note. <gasps> <laughs> Nat was no longer afraid of things to come, but was overwhelmed with remorse for having allowed something to escape that he would never recapture. And then he felt a hand on his shoulder. Why, Chanticleer, what ails you? Has the cock's crow become too bittersweet? Who are you? Don't you know? Your family has been dodging me down the centuries. Dr. Lear might have been my devoted servant, but so was my jester. And look what happened to him. No, it's you, foolish, flawed Nat, who has been my unwitting secret agent. Everything you've done to rid Lud of my influence has achieved precisely the opposite and brought you here, to me. Duke Aubrey? How I laughed when you and Ambrose pledged with the words taken from my mysteries. And little did you think when you cursed in my tapestry room that you had pronounced the most potent charm in fairy. <laughs> By the sun, moon, and stars, and the golden apples of the west. Poor Chanticleer. I have often wished my honey were not so bitter to the taste. Believe me, I fain would find an antidote to the bitter herb of life, but none grows this side of the hills, or the other. 
Why do I feel this way when I have never tasted the fruit? There are many trees in my orchard, and various are the fruit they bear. Music and dreams and grief and sometimes joy. All your life you have eaten fairy fruit, and someday you may hear the note again. But now I'll grant you a vision, and they are sometimes sweet to the taste. Come with me. Up to the top of the hill. Look down. And tell me what you see. Um, nothing much. Just desolate uplands in the moonlight. By the sun, moon, and stars, and the golden apples of the west. Is that fairyland? Or is it Dorimer? Transfigured. What do you see? I, I, I see the, the same uplands, but changed. I mean, now they're fair and, and fertile. Everything serene, like trees. The piece of pictures. Oh, if only it could stay that way. I might never have to die. Everyone must die. And so the delusion vanished, leaving Nat with all that was left, alone on the edge of a black abyss. Duke Aubrey, where are you? <laughs> Where's Ranulf? Is he in there? Ranulf? Ranulf? Don't be afraid, Ranulf. I'm coming. I'm coming. Gone. Mum Chance ended the import of fairy fruit, but the people were not happy. If the town chooses to rise, we can do nothing against them, Your Worship. Mayor Ambrose was terrified, and Dame Marigold was in mourning. It was as if Lud was also on the brink of the abyss, until... Father! Oh, love! Where have you been? We danced wildly down the waste places of the sky and were imprisoned in a castle in the moon. We were chased by angry trees into the dapple and entangled in the weeds. It was Uncle Nathaniel set us free. Yes, Master Nathaniel delivered us. Nat is alive? I is Ranulf with us? We have a message from Master Wisp. He says there must be no rioting and to keep the people quiet, for the Duke will send his deputy. Lud must throw wide its gates to receive its destiny. What is its destiny? Who is his deputy? Your Worship, my men report an army of fairies has crossed the debatable hills and is coming to Lud. We must barricade the gates and prepare for battle. No, wait. There's no time. There is wild time. And I pledged, by the living and the dead, by the past and the future, by memories and hopes, that if a vision comes begging at our door, we will take it in and warm it at our hearth. And, and that, that we, we will, will not be wiser, wiser than, than the foolish, foolish nor more cunning than the simple. And that we will remember, he who rides the wind needs must go where his steed carries him. Instead of barring its gates and testing its cannon, Lud raised its flags, festooned its streets with ivy, and flung the west gate wide open for... My boy and me, side by side, on white chargers. Oh, those chanted clears. And behind us, battalions of the dead, their milk-white mares laden with gifts. The dapple flows into the door. People of Lud, our ancestors built our town between these two rivers. The door has brought gold, and we have gladly accepted it. But the tribute of the dapple we have ever spurned even though it is as wholesome and necessary to man as the other gifts brought by our silent friends. And if all the gifts of life are good, perhaps too are all the shapes she takes and which we cannot alter. So, rather than fear them, why don't we embrace them? There's fairy fruit for everyone. Come and taste it. The accounts of what happened next read more like legends than history, 
and legends cannot be trusted any more than epitaphs. But we do know that in time, Nat went to reap the fields of gilly flowers, or to moulder in the fields of grammary. And below his coffin in the family chapel, a brass tablet read, Here lies Nathaniel Chanticleer, beloved husband, father, and mayor of Ludd in the Mist, to whom was granted no small share of the peace and prosperity he helped to bestow on his town and his country. Nat would have appreciated that, whether it was true or not. <laughs> With Lily, Jamanda, and Sops in wine, with sweet briar and bonfire and strawberry wire and columbine. In Lud in the Mist by Holt Murleys, adapted by Joy Wilkinson. The narrator was Olivia Pooley. Nathaniel Chanticleer was Richard Lumsden and Endymion Lear, Lloyd Hutchinson. Ambrose Honeysuckle and Portunus were played by Tony Turner and Ranulph Chanticleer and Young Nat by Elijah Wolfe. Willie Wisp was Robert Lonsdale and Mum Chance was Sean Mason. Moon Love Honeysuckle was Ema Ferran and Prunella Pie Powders, Rhea Marshall. Marigold Chanticleer and the Widow Gibbity were played by Jane Slavin and Primrose Crabapple and Mother Tibbs by Ellie Darville. Duke Aubrey was played by Neil Gaiman. Music was by Adam Summerhays and Murray Granger, The Cider House Rebellion. The director was Abigail Le Fleming. Lud in the Mist was a BBC audio production for Radio 4. Ho, ho, ho! ho.